Welcome to the Hills. I know I'm talking to some people online right now. We're a church with three campuses at North Richard Hills, West Fort Worth and South Lake in Tarrant County. And if you're ever in Texas, we would love for you to visit. Uh, shout out to all the dads today. I hope your day is magnificent. And uh, what a blessing to commission the Birchfield family to go and do their great work. And I want to give an endorsement to uh, the event on this campus Wednesday night. If you're at South Lake, we want you to come to this campus. If you're at West Fort Worth, we're going to stream it live. But you're going to witness a conversation about race. And then uh, at every campus going forward, we're going to create opportunities for you to take a next step in teaching and in small groups. And so I think it's a great next step for us as a church. I hope you'll be a part of it. So we're going to wrap up next week this series called Epic Grace. And the idea is no matter how big your fail is, God's grace is bigger still. And the thing I love about the Bible is that it tells the truth about people's fails. The Bible doesn't do cover-up. It shows you the hero's warts and all. Not every person's perfect. Not every ending is happy. The Bible has a chapter of champions of faith in Hebrews 11, and you wonder how some of the people got in it. In fact, we're going to look at one of those people today. His name is Samson. He's in Judges uh, chapter 13 through 16, and we'll get there in a moment. But to help you visually imagine that champions can fail, I want to show you a video of one of my champions. In fact, my favorite champion because I'm married to her. Now, here's the context. So some years ago, we went to watch friends from our church play in a co-ed softball game. We're in the stands watching. One of the ladies gets hurt, and she cannot continue to play, which would cause our team to have to forfeit unless someone could replace her. So they call out to my wife, come out of the stands, come take her place. My wife has never played softball ever. To my knowledge, she's never held a bat or put on a glove. But she comes out to help, takes off her flip-flops, puts on this lady's shoes, which are two sizes too big. And in the next inning, my wife goes up to bat, something I've never seen her do, something she's never done. So I got out my phone because I knew this was about to be epic. <laughs> so please watch. That's right. She totally fell down. In case you weren't watching, let's do that again one more time. See, and I don't think you'd quite get how ugly that fall was. So could we do that again in slow motion? I want you to get the whole... Here she goes. There's just nothing graceful about that. You can't put a good spin on that, okay? By the way, I have my wife's permission to show you that video and it helps that she's out of town today. So <laughs> that's how the Bible tells stories. It doesn't do cover up. So when we read about Samson in Judges 13 through 16, he gets more space than any other judge in the book. The truth is, it's a record of fail after fail. But I'm going to contend his story is also the record of grace upon grace. And whenever grace is a part of the story, the story can turn into an epic. And grace is all over the life of Samson. In fact, it's there before he's born. His calling was God's grace to Samson. Here's the context. The people of Israel are under oppression of a people called the Philistines, who will be a thorn in their side until the days of King David. For 40 years, they've been under their oppression. There is a couple of the tribe of Dan who are childless. The woman is barren. Completely unexpected because they're not praying for this. An angel of the Lord shows up and gives this message to the woman. You will become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor because the boy is to be a Nazarite, dedicated to God from the womb. He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. So several things about this calling stand out to me. One, 
is that he's the only judge who was promised before he was even born. The second is his reveal party is epic. Think about it. Who in the Bible has their birth announced before they're born by an angel? Just four people. Isaac, John the Baptist, Jesus, and Samson. That's pretty elite company. But the most amazing thing about this call is that he's called to be a deliverer when no one else is calling for one. You see, in the entire narrative of Samson's life and the 20 years he ruled, not one time do the people repent and cry out to God for deliverance. What Satan wants to do to the church today is limit and diminish her, and his first choice is not persecution. His first choice is accommodation, to get the people of God to so accept the way things are that they just say it's normal, and they stop asking God to change it. And that's where Israel was. But here's the thing. God doesn't always wait to send a Savior until you know you need one. We weren't asking for Jesus when God sent him. And so God's call on Samson wasn't just grace to Samson. It was grace to the whole nation. And the way this call was recognized and received was through something called the Nazarite vow. Back in those days, if you had a season where you really wanted to spend time with the Lord, you would take this vow and you would promise to do three things. One was that you wouldn't go near anything dead. The second was you wouldn't drink anything from a vine. Basically, you would live a non-alcoholic life. And the third was that you would never cut your hair or shave your head. Okay? So he's told that he's to be a Nazarite before he's born. This isn't for a season. This isn't for a few months. His whole life, he's to do these three things. Never get near a dead thing, non-alcoholic life, never shave any hair on your head. What did he look like? I'm thinking cross between Duck Dynasty and ZZ Top is what I'm thinking, okay? <laughs> and so you know he must have constantly asked his parents as a little boy, why do I have to be so different? And they had to constantly remind him of his calling. No, Samson, you cannot go to the funeral with your daddy. You can't be around dead things. You're set apart for God. No, Samson, you can't go to that party. You know there's going to be a lot of drinking there. You're not supposed to drink alcohol, Samson. You're set apart for God. No, Samson, I know the other boys tease you about your hair, but Mama can't cut it because you're set apart for God. And the chapter ends with these words. The woman gave birth to a boy and named him Samson. He grew and the Lord blessed him, and the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him. Now, that leads right into the next thing we learn about Samson. Because if you ask anybody, what do you know about Samson? You say, well, he was strong. But why was he strong? You see, his strength was God's grace in Samson. Now, I'm going to go old school for a moment. My generation will remember this. That when we were little, there was no children's program during worship. You had to sit on the pew next to your mom and dad the whole time and be still. And at least once a month, if your daddy didn't pick you up and take you out and give you a whipping, then your daddy couldn't be a deacon, okay? <laughs> and my daddy made deacon in every church we ever went to. So I had to learn strategies how to not get whippings at church. And one of mine was my mom and dad gave me this old King James Bible. I couldn't read it, but it was full of great pictures. And my favorite was Samson. He was on a hill, had something in his hand. I didn't know what it was, but he was just kicking tail. And there were fallen people all around him. And the guy was a brute. He was 50% bigger in mass than all the other guys he was whipping. He was jacked. He was ripped. It was clearly he was on steroids. I mean, this guy was big. And here's the thing. Nowhere in Scripture is Samson's strength attributed to his size. He's never described as a giant muscular man. Now, the Bible will tell you if a person's big. 
It'll tell you how big Goliath was. It'll say King Saul was head and shoulders bigger than anyone else. Never says that about Samson. Because his strength had nothing to do with his muscles. Now, I'm going to show you some examples of that. So, one time Samson is going down to set up a wedding with a woman we'll get to later. It says a lion came out and attacked him. Now, look at what the Bible says, chapter 14, verse 6. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn a young goat. Now, that cracks me up because apparently the author thinks everybody will get the metaphor. It was like tearing apart a young goat. Did they have tear apart young goat parties back then? <laughs> Is this something everybody could do? I made a list of all the animals I could tear apart with my hands. I came up with butterfly and earthworm, okay? <laughs> but the point, notice, was that it was the Spirit of the Lord that gave him the strength to do what he did. Now, he's going down later to the same place to get married. He goes by to see the carcass of that lion. By the way, not supposed to do that. That's a dead thing. There was a beehive in it, so he scooped out some honey and got an idea. Got down to the wedding, said to all the guys there, the Philistine men at the feast, I'm going to tell you a riddle. If you get it, I'll give all of you a suit of clothes. If you don't, you got to all give me a suit of clothes. What came out of something that was strong, that was sweet to eat? Well, they can't figure it out. After three days, they go to his wife and they say, tell us the answer or we're going to kill you. Philistines cannot take a joke, okay? So she nags him, he tells her, she tells them, they get the answer right. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Samson says, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you wouldn't have got my riddle. Okay, guys, everybody guys, listen to me. Number one, do not plow with another man's heifer. Number two, do not call your wife a heifer. Okay. So he's furious. Look what it says next. Then the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. He went down to Ashkelon, struck down 30 of their men, stripped them of everything, and gave their clothes to those who had explained the riddle. So once again, what makes Samson strong? It is the Spirit of the Lord working powerfully in him. So this starts a whole series of a back and forth events, Samson against the Philistines, the Philistines against Samson, a lot of killing going on. Finally, the Philistines chase Samson back to Israel. He's hiding in the cave. Then the Israelites come out to him and say, what are you doing? Don't you know the Philistines are our lords? Now, isn't that interesting? Never once in his 20 years does the Israelite nation rise up and rally behind Samson. Never once do they try to defend him as their deliverer. They want to turn him over to the Philistines. So they tie him up with ropes. And here's what it says. The Philistines came toward him shouting. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. The ropes on his arms became like charred flax. And the bindings dropped from his hands. And finding a fresh jawbone of a donkey, he grabbed it and struck down a thousand Man, that's that picture in my Bible as a boy I was looking at. So here's the point. Samson's great feats of strength are not because of his muscles. It's because of his mission. His great strength was grace strength, okay? He's a picture of what a threat a spirit-filled man is to the enemy's of God. It was grace that gave him strength. In fact, all of his success was due to grace. It was God's grace through him that made Samson successful. Because so many of his strong moments were created by displays of weak character. When you read the chapters about Samson, one of the questions that you think is, I thought he was born to deliver Israel from the Philistines. Why is he spending so much time partying with the Philistines? Look at chapter 14 again. Samson went down to Timnah and saw there a young Philistine woman. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I've seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. 
His father and mother replied, Isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives or among all our people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me. She's the right one for me. Now, ever since that little boy could walk, he was told the same thing every day by his mom and daddy. Samson, you've been set apart for God. Samson, God has given you the ministry of delivering your people from the Philistines. Then why is he always out there hanging out with the Philistines? How is Marion, a Philistine woman, going to help him answer God's call on his life? But he said to his daddy, get her for me. She's the right one for me. Now, that doesn't mean anything to you in English, but in Hebrew it means a lot. There's a phrase all through the book of Judges. Everyone did what was evil. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. It's almost exactly the same phrase. What Samson said was, get her for me. She's right in my eyes. She's the one I want. She looks good to me. She's right in my eyes. You see, Samson's credibility was weakened his whole life by his struggle with the lust of his eyes. And maybe that's why Israel never rallied behind Samson. Because they saw a strong man, but they also saw a man more driven by his desires than by his destiny. See, Samson didn't have a moment of weakness. Samson had a pattern of weakness. Another story in chapter 16. He goes to a city called Gaza, another Philistine city. Why are you there? And it says he saw a prostitute. I guess she looked right in his eyes too. So he slept with her. They were going to ambush him the next morning. Well, he got up in the middle of the night, grabbed the gates of the city, carried them up on a hill. So, yes, it was a feat of great strength created by a moment of weak character. You see, the success that God granted Samson was not because of his character. It was in spite of his character. God just kept blessing Samson grace upon grace, just like he does to us. But Samson made a mistake. Samson concluded that God's patience with his sin meant God was indifferent to his sin. And God brought somebody here to hear that statement. I'm talking to somebody right now, and you're making the same mistake. You've got a pattern of sin in your life. And so far, nothing's happened. And you are interpreting God's patience with your sin as God's indifference to your sin. You listen to me. God loves to show mercy. But God does not like to be mocked. And every father here knows, if you love a child that consistently rebels, you will discipline that child. And so we're about to read of one of the biggest fails in the Bible. But I'm going to argue that even Samson's fail was God's grace for Samson. So here's how it starts. Sometime later, he fell in love, I would argue he fell in lust, with a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, see if you can lure, what does the word lure mean? It means there's a hook involved. See if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength and how we can overpower him so that we may tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, tell me the secret of your great strength and how you can be tied up and subdued. The Philistines had been studying Samson. And they'd come to two conclusions. Number one, something's making his strong that has nothing to do with the size of his body. Something's going on here. There's a secret. And the second thing they knew He may be strong, but he's also weak, and we know what his weakness is. 
The man cannot control his eyes. And so, Delilah, we will pay you to use your body as bait. We will pay you sex for secrets. And so, she comes to her boyfriend and says, hey, honey, you know I love you so much. And lovers don't keep anything from each other, right? How come you're so strong? He decided he'd play a game. Well, you know, if you tied me up with fresh bowstrings, I'd be as weak as any man. So she does. It just so happens that some Philistines show up. He breaks free, chases them away. Now, any fool can see what's going on here. But he keeps playing. I thought you loved me. You didn't tell me what makes you so strong. You know, if you tied me up with fresh ropes, I'd be as weak as any man. She does. Same thing happens. He goes back to her tent. Honey, what makes you so strong? Well, you know, if you took my hair, uh uh-oh, he's getting too cute. If you took my hair and took the braids, weaved it into a loom, I'd be weak as any man. So she does, same thing happens, and he goes back to her tent. And you're thinking, is he the dumbest farm boy that ever came in from the country? No, the problem was not that he was dumb. The problem was he thought he was so smart. Samson had decided that he could presume upon the grace of God. That God's grace is my entitlement. And I can use the grace of God in my life any way I want for whatever I want. In short, God's grace is for my purpose. So she just kept up. And finally he said, okay, I'll tell you. Verse 15. How can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? This is the third time you've made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. With such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was sick to death of it. So he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I've been a Nazarite dedicated to God from my mother's womb. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I'd become as weak as any other man. You see, there were lots of people back then with long hair. There were lots of people back then taking Nazarite vows. So no one associated his hair length with his great strength. But please understand, it wasn't losing the hair that was the issue. It was Samson showing total disregard to his vow to God. He's already broken the part about going near dead things. He's way past the part about not drinking alcohol. The only part of that vow he has still honored was keeping his head unshaved. And Samson has got to the point of his walk with God that even that is worth sacrificing if it's what it takes to get the woman I want. Now, you can ignore God, but you cannot ignore the consequences. So it says that uh, he fell asleep in her lap, and she had someone come in and shave his head. Question, how can you have that much hair and get it shaved off and not wake up? Answer, he was drunk. He was out of it. He was in a stupor. Then she called Samson. The Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But one of the saddest verses in the Old Testament. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Then the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza. And binding him with bronze shackles, they set him to grinding grain in the prison. It's the only time in the book of Judges that one of God's Judges is defeated. And the irony is they plucked out his eyes. That's his problem his whole life. He couldn't control his eyes. God was using defeat to discipline his son. And God will do that. There are people in this room right now listening to me that would tell you, the best thing God ever did to me was let me be defeated. I was walking in my sin, and God could not get my attention with his affectionate whispers. God had to knock me down. 
so that I would finally look up. But it says in verse 22, but the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Now, I've got this old study Bible. It's over 30 years old in my office. I write notes in it. And over 30 years ago, when I read that verse, in big letters, I wrote beside it in the margin, grace. What you're going to see is that his finish was God's grace with Samson. You see, it said the Lord had left Samson. What does that mean? When God leaves somebody, it doesn't mean that God abandons them. It means that God withdraws His gracious protection from them. It means that God says, okay, I have been protecting you from the foolishness of your sin, but I'm not going to do that anymore. I am going to let you experience the full weight of the consequence of your rebellion in the hopes it will bring you to repentance. But the truth is, God always holds on to us more tightly than we hold on to Him. And it's never too late to return to your calling. And so, they get all the Philistines together at their temple to have a big party to celebrate capturing Samson. They bring him out to make sport of him. Have Samson perform for us. And Samson says, to the servant leading him along. Take me to the two pillars holding up this temple. And then Samson does something he's never done before. He prays to God before he uses his strength. Because it's finally dawned on Samson, God made me strong for his purpose, not for mine. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God, strengthen me just once more and let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. And then Samson reached toward the two central pillars on which the temple stood, bracing himself against them, his right hand on the one, his left hand on the other. Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And then he pushed with all his might, and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people. And it thus he killed many more when he died than while he lived. His life was fail after fail after fail. But our weaknesses do not cause God to abandon His purposes. God never approves of our fails. But He always proves gracious to recovering failures. His mercies are new every morning. I thought today would be a great day to hear from one of our dads who learned that lesson. So please watch Javier's testimony. Alcohol. Alcohol was a big deal in my life. Uh, uh, That was one of the things that kind of got me uh, on a a, a cliff uh, later in life. Uh, I was just messing up for the UIs. When I got pulled over, I was like, oh, not again. And uh, this is the fourth time that I've been pulled over by drinking and driving. When I was in the cell, I felt miserable. I felt like I was worthless. I thought it was it, was, uh, it, was it. I was scared. I didn't want, I didn't want my life, my, my family to, to leave me. That's when I, it's when I got on my knees, the first time I guess in my life. Pero mis hijos y yo era algo que, que estábamos esperando hace muchos años atrás. No era algo que él decidió obtener ese día, pero nosotros ya lo habíamos deseado muchos años atrás y nosotros ya estábamos, nosotros esperábamos ese momento, nosotros deseábamos ese momento, pero pienso que fue el momento de Dios, pero era algo que nosotros estábamos esperando como familia. It was, uh, it was that moment that I realized that I needed to change my life, and, uh, and I couldn't do it on my own. Uh, but then I, I realized that, that I had the one that was going to do it for me and help me through it. Now I know it was God working through that situation, and, and it changed me completely. It's, it's just been amazing. The blessings, it just keep coming and coming. And it's, I don't deserve this, you know. It's just, 
It's crazy. Uh, neither of my kids, neither my wife has been baptized. So I, I decided I wanted to get baptized and uh, last minute they're like, we want to get baptized too. And I'm like, are you sure? And you're like, yeah. So I called that way. That was not gonna be just one. It's gonna be, it's gonna be six. I'm like, what? Yeah. All my kids and my wife want to get baptized, and it was, it was great. It was the greatest moment ever. When I was getting out of the water, and I seen every, every single one of my kids and my wife getting out of the water. I'm like, wow. It was just amazing. The best feeling ever. I lead a men's group uh, here at the hills every Sunday. So we talked about uh, how our week goes and went, and and we're just just full of joy. Uh, something that I didn't have before. We're not trying to make a story. The story is there, and it's the story of God through me. We don't have to make something up. It's, it's there, and it's real. Amen. I love that. So I want to wrap up this teaching with two quick points that in some ways aren't just about Samson, but about every story we've talked about in this series. And here's the first point, that grace knows there is failure in my future. God has only called and commissioned one perfect servant. Every other person God has called had failed failure in their future, and God knew it. There's only one that can be a savior. The rest of us need one. Now, I'm not saying that failing is not a big deal. I'm saying God knows that we're going to fail, and that grace is a bigger deal. And so maybe, maybe you need to extend some grace to somebody who failed you. In fact, let me go out on a limb. Maybe today, some of you need to extend some grace to your father. When God calls a man to be a father, he never called him to be perfect. Every father's got some fail. And maybe today, God is calling you to extend some grace to your dad. Maybe Dad, God is calling you to extend some grace to yourself. There's this wonderful little verse in the book of Luke where Jesus said to Simon, Satan is asked to sift all of you as wheat, but I've prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, Strengthen your brothers. Do you hear what Jesus is saying? Simon, I see fail in your future. But I'm praying for your faith. It's going to hang in there. You're going to turn back. And when it does, I've got an assignment for you. Yes, grace knows there's failure in my future. But grace sees a future after my failure. That's some good news. Get excited. See, no one. No one can fall beyond the reach of grace, and no fail is beyond the redemption of grace. And I'm talking to somebody right now that needs to hear me say, it is time for you to stop obsessing and focusing and thinking about what might have been or what could have been or what should have been. It is time to start thinking and praying about what could still be, because there's a future after your failure. Sometimes... We sing a song here that has a chorus I just love. By your spirit, I will rise from the ashes of defeat. Holy Spirit power is just one ask away. And a person filled with the spirit will always be a great threat. To the enemies of God. There is a future after your failure. The hair on your head can grow again. And to make that point, let's just go back to that ball field one more time and watch my wife.
My wife just got two RBIs. She got two RBIs. She hit a line drive base hit. Let's give it up for Jamie. So, how far can a person fall before grace is done with them? Answer, no one knows because it hasn't happened yet. Grace is that epic. Let's pray. So God, please give us ears to hear today. Someone needs some grace today. Someone needs some Holy Spirit strength today. Someone needs the power of God to forgive. Someone needs your power to get back up and keep living. We all need. We all need to believe that our worst moment is not as big as your best. And so God, help us today to experience a fresh, real, supernatural encounter of grace. And help us to give it to someone else. For Jesus' sake, amen. Amen. Let me ask you all to stand up, please. If you're on the prayer response team, would you take your place, please? We're going to offer the gift of prayer. We're going to offer the gift of baptism. And I've been thinking a lot as we're about to wrap up this series next week. I think I'm talking to a lot of people that need to be baptized. Like Javier's family, you haven't taken that step yet. I wish this week you'd contact one of the ministers of our church or just talk to one of us about that. And let's just see some people get baptized next week. It could be powerful. I believe every story in the Bible points to Jesus. Samson's story does in many ways. For one, think about it. Samson's greatest victory was when he died. So was Jesus. The greatest blow he ever gave the enemy was when he died for all of your sins and freed you from his clutches. But when Samson died, his rule was over. When Jesus died, his rule was beginning. He's king of kings. He's Lord of lords. He's on the throne. He's going to come back for all who have received his grace. You be sure you're among that number while we worship together.